Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this icon next to me, it's my best day ever because it's Patricia Arquette. Yay. She is an Oscar winner, an <laughs> Emmy winner, a Golden Globe winning actor. She is also a producer and an activist. You know her from a million things going back decades, including one of my favorites, True Romance, including Boyhood, and more re Medium, and in more recent years, you were just on a roll lately, Escape at Dunamora, Severance, and now your latest show for Apple TV Plus. It is so exciting. It's an absolute, I don't word this, use this word lightly, tour de force. Hi, Desert. I'm yeah. so absolutely obsessed with this show. Let's get into it. Great. You are such a wild character in this show. It starts up here and it kind of stays up here the whole time. Tell me about Peggy. Tell me who she is and what it was that drew you to this unique, messy, wonderful character. Well, Peggy, um, our director, Jay Roach, described her as a rock and roll hummingbird. And the way that she was written, she's constantly pivoting and moving. She's kind of a hustler in her mind, a little bit of a manipulator. She also is very loving and maternal and collects all these kind of broken people with their broken stories and tries to fix their life at the same time. She's on a hustle and trying to get her needs met. Um, she's an addict, but she's also codependent. So she's got this kind of interesting mixture, but she's basically like a whirling dervish of a human being. And part of her rapid pace is I think her avoidance of the pain that she's really in. Yeah, I like when you talk about the hustle because there's a moment early on in the show where she says, I have to get a hustle. And her mm -hmm. friends no, you have to hustle. <laughs> and she right, has to yeah. kind of learn the difference. And it's it's in many ways, I think, a classic TV show. It it harkens back to me to kind of shows from the 70s mm -hmm. where it's this messy, flawed private investigator, except yeah. it's A, so beautifully written, so unusual, so of a particular time, and and it has a woman. Yeah, we wanted we want it to be messy. We wanted it to be jagged. We didn't want it to be all tied up and perfect all the time. And it is a farce and it is absurd. And it is all these crazy characters. We grew up in a time where there was like, there was a TV show about a man who's a monkey, best friend. <laughs> you know, we had, you know, the Dukes of Hazard and craziness. And these writers were so open. I'd call them and say, I just saw this movie, The Velvet Vampire, and she's driving around in dune buggy. Remember dune buggies? Yeah, dune buggies. Hey, let's have Peggy drive a dune buggy. Great. So it was just exciting that everyone would bring all these great ideas. So there is a love letter to the 80s and 90s. And that kind of energy and those kind of people that live on the fringe of society that find themselves gravitating to the desert because they don't quite fit in. Yeah, and it's uh, when you talk about this this hummingbird character, the physicality that you embody in this show with this incredible cast, Matt Dillon, Brad Garrett, Bernadette Peters, uh, all these amazing young actors as well. It's, it's an incredible group of people and you are literally swinging from the rafters. You are crashing this car. You are doing all kinds of really intense work. I want to ask about what that was like for you. How do you prepare for that kind of work where it's not just as an actor, it's not just thinking and cerebral. You have to get out there and yeah. swing from the rafters. Well, well, I think the first scene we ever shot was swinging from the rafters. And somehow, I don't even remember how now, but like a week before we start shooting, I threw my back out and I don't really do that, but it was so bad. I don't know how I'm going to do this. The dune buggy doesn't have a door. You have to climb over it. Everything is crazy. I'm going to hang from a rafter. So I was like, well, it's like our first day of shooting. They're going to put me in this harness. I'm either going to really be messed up or it's going to fix my back. And it fixed my back. <laughs> <laughs> I was hanging in it for hours. And I got out and I was like, my back is fixed. So uh, a little DIY alignment. Is that, the, is that the secret? You know what? At that moment, I knew. You know, the fates had aligned. And God was on our side. And there was a little sun shining on us. Perfection. Every review that I've read of this 
show, and certainly in my own watching of it, the writing is up here. The writing is incredible. Created by these amazing female writers who now, as you have said in an interview in Sky, kind of don't get to celebrate this at I this know. moment right now. It's what awful. Is, what is this, the impact of this strike and this moment been for you as an actor, as a producer, and as someone who very famously has called out about wage equality in your industry, especially for women? Well, these three women have been working, toiling over this project for at least seven years. I mean, we met probably six years ago about this project and they've been tweaking and changing it ever since. They write really fast. They're incredible together. They each bring a different strength. They have such an original voice together. Um, and it really made me laugh out loud when I was reading the scripts. And it's a different kind of humor. It's not clean. and It's not cleaned up around the edges. There's something about Peggy and the way she sees the world and the voice that she has that they've written that reminds me of people, is refreshing to me, is provocative. Um, and I really wish they could totally embrace this moment. I know what, what they're fighting for and I support their fight for that. But I celebrate that, you know, and I think this work couldn't exist without them at all. Yeah, and this is also another collaboration going back 27 years with Ben Stiller for you. You started with Flirting with Disaster, obviously the last couple of years, Escape at Dynamora, Severance, now this. What is it about this really special, unique bond that the two of you seem to have? I've, I've heard you say that when you were offered Severance, you, it was him that really drew you into it. What is it about that collaboration that you two have? It's really special. It is really special and I feel very grateful for it. I loved working with Ben as an actor opposite him and then in Escape at Dannemora as a actor and then again with Severance as a director, actor relationship. And then on this as a producer, um, I think we both have discriminating taste and I think we both usually agree with each other's taste or turn each other on to new things. So there's that kind of a shorthand and uh, an honesty. And I, I think that we both know or we trust that each other will work very hard and be pretty um, relentless in giving everything to uh, the projects we work on. Yeah, and you, obviously you've been acting most of your life now. You come... <laughs> Knock on a little wood. You come from an acting dynasty. It's in your blood, your grandfather, your father, your siblings. My great-grandparents. Your great-grandparents, vaudeville, right? Yeah. And yet, uh, I have heard you say that you weren't entirely sure you wanted to go into this profession. Yeah, I felt like maybe I'd be too shy for it or I wouldn't be good at it, you know? Just because you want to do something doesn't mean you're going to be good at it necessarily. And having watched my dad really struggle to support us, five kids and two adults uh, on a working actor's salary, I knew that it was really a long shot. I mean, my sister was on it, had been working a lot and doing incredible movies like Baby It's You with John Sayles and she was having a lot of success and a wonderful actor. And I felt also like, will I be in her shadow? I mean, do I, it's a nebulous time was for me, my youth, even in myself. I had a sense of myself, but I was also very nebulous still of who I really was and my own self-esteem, I think. So I decided I would give myself a year to try acting. And then, lo and behold, I got work. And then I got another little job and another one. And each one I would learn a different skill. So it's just staying in it for the next job, right? So it seems to, and the next thing you know, you've got a 30-year career behind you and so much more in front of you, right? Yeah, my B plan was I was going to go and be a, a midwife if it didn't work out. I gave myself a year to see. I didn't want to be doing it for 20 years 
I mean, people say never give up on your dream. And I think that's a beautiful thing to say. But I also felt like I probably would have given up on that dream if it didn't happen in a year. And I would have gone on to another dream. Right. That, it's not giving up on a dream as, as much as maybe finding a new one. I want to ask you about this dream of being a doula because you are so vocal and outspoken about reproductive justice, reproductive rights. You've been banging on that drum for years now. You've been talking about it certainly, especially since the 2016 election. Looking at where we are now, post Dobbs, what are you seeing, what are you doing, what concerns you as a, as a woman, as a parent, as an activist, as a person in America? Yeah, when I was 15, one of my first jobs was working at Planned Parenthood. And I'd go around to schools and talk about different birth control methods to other kids, including abstinence. You'd ask them, like, what are different birth control methods? And they'd never say abstinence. And I'd always say, you all forgot a very important one abstinence. And I learned that from my training at Planned Parenthood. And I would sometimes be in the room with doctors and assist the nurse practitioner. So much health care happens at Planned Parenthood. And the fact that they started rolling back funding for them. And then now I knew in the 2016 election that we were looking at women's rights, that it was on the line, that we were going to lose the Supreme Court that it was no joke. And it's happening in America. Women, it's illegal for women in certain places to get have abortions before they even know they're pregnant normally. Many women don't know at six weeks they're even pregnant. So they don't even know that that's, there's that option. And obviously, there's a big difference between women who have money and the health care that they can have and leave the state to those who have no money, have no options, maybe with an abusive partner, and the state's against them. And now we have women who are walking around with non-viable fetuses, th threatening their bodies with sepsis, and they're wandering around, and the state is forcing them to do this. I'm horrified at what's happening, and people are disgusted. Everywhere I travel in the world, people are like, what's happening in America? There's no goodwill, there's no faith, there's no understanding, there's no holding other people's pain and their life experience and the painful choice they're making and trusting them in that choice. This whole narrative about these late-term abortions, they don't exist. It's not true. People don't carry a, a, a fetus for that long and then just decide they're going to have an abortion. Doctors won't do that. The whole thing's a non-argument. It's just a giant lie. And the fact that we don't have the women, the, the Equal Rights Amendment, we don't ha aren't explicitly in our own constitution, founding document of our own country, has really impacted us. And it terrifies me, honestly. I was scared when my son was coming to be 18 when he was young, that we were going to go to war and my son was going to be sent to war. I'm terrified having a 20-year-old daughter in America with her right to her own body. Me too. Me too. And I want to ask you about something else because when we look at these issues and we look about the oppression and the attack on rights, it all also comes down so much to gender and gender expression. You have lost a sibling who you celebrate often on your Instagram and your social media, the fight against trans people, against gender expression of all forms, it's all tied in the same thing. When you see this, when you see bans on just drag performances, when you see bans on non-conforming attire, what are you thinking? This all is personal things, for you. They're also trying to take away an adult's right to any kind of health care, a trans person gender reaffirming care in certain places. Children can't even mention it. You know, if they think that they're trans, they, they're not even allowed to talk to anyone about it, let alone a doctor, let alone, you know, their schoolmates or a support system or a teacher or anyone. Again, we're going back to this lack of humanity, this lack of goodwill. 
This is what kills marriages. You're going to get a divorce if you have a lack of goodwill for each other. We as a country have a lack of goodwill for each other. Trans people are not the enemy. The problems in your life, if you really sit down and look at them, they have nothing to do with trans people. Nothing to do with trans people and what they're doing to their own bodies. Nothing to do with trans people existing in film, LGBT people, characters in movies. The problems in your life aren't there, but they've given you another scary other, another, they keep pointing the finger of what you're supposed to be afraid of and that's your new enemy. And people keep falling for it. And it's crazy and it's heartbreaking because people are, I mean, the beautiful thing about it, because I do want to find a beautiful thing about it, is we know a lot more. A large portion of, of, the, demo, of, of the American population are more open, are more understanding, are more embracing. And honestly, there's millions more of us. What we have to do is make sure that no matter what, we get elected leaders in positions that are loving, are understanding, that do protect personal freedoms in the United States of America, which was supposed to be this country of freedom. It's interesting that that's reversed itself, this idea of freedom. So unless we have political leaders, and they may not be the perfect leader, and they may not check all of our boxes, but if they're going to move us to towards progress and appoint better uh, judges, enact better laws, we need to move back towards that. We need to claw back some territory now, because we really lost a lot in 2016. Yeah, and we can't take that for granted, which also means voting and fighting for our voting rights as well. And also, I mean, I have gotten in arguments, uh, you know, conversations, heated conversations with people I love. In 2016, I begged people for your granddaughter, for my daughter, go vote, go vote. Promise me you're going to go vote. Promise me you care about that. If for nothing else, you may not love this person, but you have to vote for her because otherwise you're giving a vote to Trump, basically. Yeah. And, and perfect uh, is the enemy of good, absolutely. I want to ask you one more thing, Patricia. Uh, first of all, you've got my vote. Uh, That's the, if you ever want to switch careers, <laughs> you've got my vote right away. Um, but I want to ask, speaking of switching careers, you've also, you're also going to be a director now. You just directed your first film. Yeah. I want to ask about Gonzo Girl, because I'm really, really excited about this. You're co-starring in it as well, and it's your first feature directing. Yeah, and it was a very humbling experience getting on that other side of the camera. You know, just even after all these decades in film, realizing how much I don't know. And the things that I thought would come so easily, like talking with actors, talking about acting, weren't necessarily the easiest things either. Um, it's called Gonzo Girl, and my lead actors are Cam Camilla Maroney and Willem Dafoe, Elizabeth Blail, Layla George, Ray Nicholson. Zoe Blue, and they all do such beautiful work. And it was so exciting. The, the material's based on this book called Gonzo Girl, um, which is a fictitious um, account of her experience working as Hunter S. Thompson's assistant uh, for several months. And so then I took it, and then we changed it again for film, but just dealing with some themes that I thought were really interesting. What it was like to be a young woman in the 90s. What was this unspoken commodity of beauty through the eyes of these male celebrities? What was it like to be kind of in their orbit? And what is it like when you're getting older and you're trapped in part of your success and you're getting love for it and acknowledgement and money? but you're also trapped by it and you resent it and you want to move on, but no one will artistically really let you move on. 
Um, there was a lot of different themes going on and competition between women and things that I thought were really interesting. And it was nice to explore those without explicitly saying them. Because I feel like nowadays when we see movies, they didn't do this in the 70s. And now, if we have any of these topics, the whole movie has to be about this one topic. And we have to talk about this topic and meet it head on. We were moving through life. We weren't stopping and really examining these things. And I think it's an interesting movie because post Me Too, you look back like, oh, wow, we have changed a lot in incremental ways. Yeah, well, what you said about being a young woman in the 90s and being seen through that male gaze, you lived that firsthand mm -hmm. as a beautiful blonde woman in the 90s. Being in this business, yeah, and just kind of, what is it like that male celebrity person who is like a son or something? And, you know, the world that gravitates around them and the, the whole ecosystem that survives off of them. And what does that look like? What's that pressure on him, too? Willem gives an incredible performance. I can't wait. But in the meantime, I get to enjoy High Desert because yeah. it is out now. Patricia, this show is so fun. It's so unique. It just is an absolute true joyride, but also with such deep heart and spirit. I love it. I can't wait for other people to watch it as well. Patricia Arquette, thank you so much for joining me today. What an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And that is the biggest compliment. It's to acknowledge its originality because I think these writers had such an original voice. Each of these actors brought something and there was so much love in this project. My love for the drug addicts and junkies I knew who passed away and their beautiful qualities. They were crazy making. They made life a nightmare. You know, there was all kinds of dysfunction. They would steal your guitar when you turned your back, but they also were brilliant and smart and funny and sweet and did love you the best that they could. So this project means so much to me and I'm, I'm so grateful that you have had me here. Oh, I'm so grateful to have you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thanks.